بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so today's lesson will actually be the final lesson for our calendar year and inshallah we will resume uh, from 2015 inshallah January and we will resume with the end so we're basically winding up inshallah maybe maybe even two or three more lessons after this one and then uh, then we have to decide what to do next after that subhanallah so uh, but today we will do um, the very final incidents in the ninth and tenth years uh, that we haven't discussed now realize that what we have discussed uh, for the last few weeks is primarily delegations and family incidents and we kind of had to break our chronology and you understood why so the delegations as we said occurred from the seventh year all the way to the tenth year and it would really just it's better just to mix them all uh, together uh, and of course the most significant delegations were the tribe of Thaqif accepting Islam in the ninth year of the Hijrah the Christians of Najran in the ninth year and perhaps the most melodramatic delegation was that of Musaylam al kadhab some of these delegations took here in the tenth took place in the tenth year as well but we discussed pretty much all of them uh, together so we had to kind of jump forward now we have to go back chronologically and talk about the next big uh, incident that occurred in, in the ninth year of the Hijrah and that is uh, the Hajj of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq the Hajj of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq now remind me when did Mecca when was the conquest of Mecca everybody should know the conquest of Mecca when Ramadan of the eighth year of the Hijrah so in the eighth year of the Hijrah could the Prophet have performed Hajj could the Muslims have performed Hajj in the eighth year why is there confusion yes they could have, they could have, because they conquered Mecca in Ramadan. Yet uh, there was no uh, basically concerted effort to perform Hajj by the Muslims in the eighth year of the Hijrah. Why? Can anybody think of a reason why? If we say too busy with delegations, then we are saying that a wajib or a fard has been delayed because of delegations. They didn't go for the purpose of Hajj in Ramadan, but then Hajj is in Dhul Hijjah. Yeah, but, I mean, you could have come again in three months. They went to Tabuk when? Hunain was when? Right after. That's eighth year. So that's, so that's Shawwal. Hunain is a Shawwal eighth year. Yeah, that's Shawwal. All of it is Shawwal. So, so they could have come back for Hajj if they wanted to. Why didn't they? Still fresh? <laughs> what is the cut today? <laughs> what is that guy you just said? Security, go on. Exactly. Mecca is not yet safe. Why is Mecca not yet fully safe? Najran, Thaqif, Tabuk. In other words, other than Hijaz, even Hijaz. How can we forget Ta'if? Ta'if is literally an hour's drive away. It's literally the next neighboring city. And Ta'if has a huge population that is very hostile. Right? So the reason why there was no concerted hajj is because it's still not feasible. You're not going to delay a wajib or a fard because of delegation. Because it's not feasible because of the security uh, threats. And therefore, in the eighth year of the hijrah, there was no... Uh, special Hajj delegation coming from Medina, from the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, there were some Muslims who performed Hajj. So for the first time, some Muslims publicly performed Hajj. This had not happened since the beginning of the Da'a, never. Now though, because Mecca is under Islamic control, so we had some Muslims perform Hajj, and the books of Sirah mention that our Prophet ﷺ placed one of the Banu Abd shams uh, which is one of the tribes of the Quraysh, one of their members, his name is Attab ibn uh, Asid, uh, Attab ibn Asid, he had placed him as a governor of Mecca. Uh, so he's a local Mac a Makkawi, he converts at the conquest of Mecca. So he's one of the late converts. Now why didn't he appoint one of the, the elite of the Quraysh? The, the old converts, why didn't he appoint one of them to be the governor of Mecca? I went over this, guys. It's a trick question, but you should know it. Why didn't he appoint Umar, Uthman? These are far more senior than Attab ibn Asid as the governor of Mecca. 
What about that? He, not him, but how about the others? Why? No, you guys are forgetting. Why did they all go back? They have to go back. Not just the Ansar, the Muhajirun are also obliged to go back. Because one of the points of the Hijrah, that because of which they were honored, is that the Muhajir cannot go back to where he came from, or else his Hijrah is nullified. So none of the Muhajirun returned to Mecca after the conquest. Guys, I went over this. I went over this. None of the Muhajirun were able to go back to Mecca, including the Prophet ﷺ. Because the, the, now this is only for special for the actual Muhajirun. As for us in our times, if somebody does hijrah from a dangerous land for the sake of Allah, then that dangerous land becomes safe again and he's able to return. He's able, allowed to return. But that group of Muhajirun, they had to make a condition that khalas, they have given up everything. And so there was no permission for the Muhajir the real muhajir to go back to Makkah, clear? That was, there was no permission given to them. They had literally given up everything. So they had to then fulfill their vow. So therefore, who was allowed to remain in Makkah? Those who never left Makkah, the converts of Makkah. So Attab ibn Asid was the governor, and it is said that, uh, and the books of history don't really mention too much because none of the elite of the Sahaba are involved, the process is not involved, but for the first time, some small group of Muslims led by the governor of Makkah, Attab, uh, he performed a uh, Hajj in the eighth year of the uh, Hijrah. As for the Prophet and the Sahaba in Medina, they did not perform Hajj in the eighth year of the Hijrah. So, in the ninth year of the Hijrah, what happens? Tabuk takes place, that is taken care of. Uh, we're going to uh, come to the issue of Najran as well later on. Inshallah, Najran, uh, end of ninth, beginning of tenth year is also taken care of. Uh, and the main thing in the ninth year is Thaqif accepts Islam. And Thaqif is the big threat to Mecca. Thaqif is right next door. We talked about the delegation of Thaqif, didn't we? They didn't want to pray, they didn't want, they wanted to drink alcohol, they want to give up zina. Remember that tribe? Okay, eventually they have to do all of that. So Thaqif accepts Islam. So now in the ninth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ decides to send Abu Bakr as Siddiq with an official delegation from Medina. Okay? And he himself does not perform. Uh, he does not perform the Hajj. And he does not perform the Hajj because he explicitly says to Abu Bakr and to others why? That he says that verily uh, the uh, Mushrikun perform Tawaf naked around the Kaaba and I do not wish to perform the Hajj until that is eliminated. So he gave the ultimate reason and that is that it is not befitting for the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to participate in the Hajj where you have Mushrikun acting in this vulgar and lewd uh, manner. Now, uh, I, we have referenced this issue a number of times very briefly. It is just a footnote here. You need to understand this concept of doing Hajj without your, doing Tawaf without your clothes. It's referenced in the Quran as we know, but I didn't really uh, talk about it. I'll just need to talk about that so we understand why uh, they did that. That Allah mentions in Surah Ma'idah verse 28, Allah mentions Surah Ma'idah verse 28, and by the way, Surah Ma'idah is the verse that mentions very explicitly, right before verse 28, Allah mentions how Hawa and Adam were seduced by uh, Iblis, and Iblis caused them to get rid of their clothes. And Allah then says that, O children of Adam, let not shaitan seduce you to take off your clothes. Then Allah says that, we have sent down clothes from the heavens. We have sent down clothes from up above. We have sent down clothes, meaning Allah, the clothes are not natural. They're not, we're the only animal creation. We're the only creation of Allah in this world that wear something above and beyond what our mothers give birth to us in. The only creation in this, in this physical world that we live in. And so Allah is saying, where did it come from? I sent it down to you. أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا So the, the concept of clothes is quite literally heavenly, divine. Then the next verse, Allah says, so look at the context, all about clothes, all about Adam and Hawa ha, having been uh, exposed and whatnot. Then Allah says, وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً 
when the Quraysh do something that is fahisha, and fahisha is any type of evil that is of a sexual nature. Generally speaking, fahisha is a lewd or a vulgar sin. And this is different than dhulm because dhulm is a sin of transgression, right? And udwan is other. So fahisha is a sin of a uh, perverse, if you like, nature. So Allah says, when they do a fahisha, what is that fahisha? It's not in the Quran. It's in the seerah and the tafsir literature. When they do a fahisha, they say as an excuse, two things. وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا أَبَاءَنَا وَاللَّهُ أَمَرَنَا بِهَا Number one, our forefathers did the same fahisha. Number two, Allah commanded us to do this fahisha. Then Allah Azza wa Jal negates. And He says, قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَى Tell them, O Messenger of Allah, that Allah does not command that which is fahsha. So what is this fahisha? The Sahaba Tabi'un, they interpreted this verse. They said, the fahisha was to perform tawaf without your clothes. This is the reference, and the context clearly indicates this. Because we all mentioned now, all of the page and a half before this verse is about clothes and whatnot. Then Allah mentions, when they do a fahisha. What is this fahisha? They would do tawaf without their uh, clothes. What was their justification? Why would they possibly, the holiest of holy places, why would you, astaghfirullah, want to do something so vulgar? By the way, also another point here. When they mention two excuses, Allah Azza wa Jal let go the first one because it was factual. Not because it was a valid evidence, but because it was true. Their forefathers did it. So Allah Azza wa Jal responded to the second allegation and let go the first one because the first one was technically true, but it's not a legitimate excuse. So what if your forefathers did it? But it was a legit, it was, sorry, it was a valid uh, historical thing to say. But the second thing they said, Allah told us to do this. Then Allah immediately said, no, Allah never commands vulgarity and fahsha. So what is their justification? Uh, Ibn Kathir and others, they mentioned two justifications. Why would you want to take your clothes off in front of the holiest of holy places and do tawaf wearing nothing? They have two excuses. The first of them I found very interesting. Uh, that they said that, uh, they said that, why should we do tawaf, sorry, uh, we should do tawaf the same way that our mothers gave birth to us. Meaning we should return to our original state that Allah created us in. Or as the fancy term, au natural, basically, nothing. Now, I found this intriguing because this is exactly the same excuse that we find the modern practitioners of the same jahili practice, right? Basically, if you, yeah, I mean, there's no point, there's no harm in saying this as well. There's this movement now, the nudist movement and whatnot. And this is the exact same logic that God created us this way. Our mothers gave birth to us this way. Why should we pervert nature? Right? And if you, subhanAllah, this is exactly the same excuse of the Jahili Arabs. That our mothers gave birth to us this way. So when we come in front of Allah, we should be like Allah created us in the beginning. And that is how natural, without, any, without anything. And so this is the same, uh, the same mentality. And the point is Allah says in the Quran, No, I sent down clothes to you. I sent down clothes to you. The second excuse that they have is that they, they would say, How can we do tawaf in the very same clothes that we have disobeyed Allah in? Isn't it shameful that in these garments we have disobeyed Allah? So how can we use the same garments we have committed sins in? So we have to get rid of the garments and then be naked, right? And this really shows you, wallahi, how easy it is to find any logic for anything. Any logic for anything. It is possible. And this is very true. I mean, just yesterday a report was released by our own country, which we see what they have done to innocent people. Right now, as we speak, you know, more than half the country is supportive of these tactics. And they think this is completely... So the point is, this type of, without any, without any divine guidance, without any sharia, anybody can justify anything. This whole, and that's my uh, tangent here, but subhanAllah, the whole notion of our intellects being 
all powerful and guiding and whatnot. Your intellect can justify anything it wants. You want to be naked doing tawaf, you will find reasons to do so. You want to torture innocent people, you will find whatever it is, you will find your justifications. That's why you need a sharia from Allah to tell you right from wrong. Because otherwise, left to our own whims and devices, anybody can justify anything that he or she wants to justify. And here we have people justifying doing tawaf, which is the greatest of deeds around the greatest of houses. And they believe this house to be sacred like we as well. But somehow in their perversion, they said, let us be natural the way Allah created us. And how can we do tawaf with the clothes that Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, we sinned in? And so uh, the books of history mention that, uh, now by the way, another point. Not everybody did tawaf naked. This was something, believe it or not, that was a sign of piety. So like the more righteous, or pi it's a sign of piety. So it's not as if every time 24-7 people are doing tawaf naked in pre-jahiliyyah, but rather maybe one out of every hundred, I'm just estimating, there are no statistics, but I'm saying it was something that was a sign of extra piety, that I will show my piety in front of everybody by showing my nudity in front of everybody. So it's not as if everybody did it, but it was something that was not uncommon. And especially during the Hajj season, because of the extra quantity, that the quantity would be increased of this nature. And also it is said that, now the people of Mecca, by the way, I need to make this point here, they did not follow this practice because they viewed themselves as being elitist. They literally thought they were elite. They thought these rules don't apply to us because we are people of the Haram. We are people of the holy place. So this was a custom of the non-Qurashis. And that is why in Hajj it also increased because that's when the non-Qurashis are coming. And there were ways out of this, by the way. So even those who wanted to do it, there were ways out of it. What are some of the ways out of it? So they would either purchase brand new clothes so that then the excuse of we having sinned in these clothes does not, would, does not work. Or they would get a Qurashi to lend one of his garments because for some reason, if the clothes are being used in Mecca, so then they are also holy. So they don't, it doesn't apply to them. And so, I mean, I, this is my ridiculous theory. I think this notion of going around the Kaaba naked unless you purchase from Mecca must have been invented by some Meccan merchant or, or clothes seller, you know? It's like, to me, it's one of my weird theories. I mean, Allahu Alam, but who else would invent it? Some perverse, some pervert guy, astaghfirullah, right? He wants to see people without clothes and he's a mar seller of, mer of, of clothes. He comes up with these notions and it becomes popular and eventually who benefits financially and even astaghfirullah from the perversion side is the people of Mecca. They get to sell. They don't have to take their clothes off. Everybody's doing it, so it's a win-win for those guys, right? Allahu Allah, that's not in the books of Sirah. Don't you don't have to write that down or no taker. This is, this is just. It is yes, that is true. Yes, yeah, Taqfirullah. Uh, and uh, the books of Sirah and the books of Tafsir mention that uh, when they would do this, even the women la hura sometimes would do this. Can you imagine? Wallahi, the vulgarity. Even the women would do this, but for the women there was a little bit of license to wear uh, what we would call maybe just a garment covering just the, the middle portion, just a little bit of that. Yeah, and something like this, okay? So they would cover a small portion uh, of their body and the rest of it they would cover with their hands. They would cover with their hands and they would versify a poem in front of everybody that Al-Yawma uh, Yabdu uh, Ba'dahu Aw Kullahu Wa Ma Yabdu Minhu Fala Uhillahu That today all of my body or some of it is now apparent to everybody but whatever is apparent I don't allow anybody to stare at me. So uh, allegedly when she says this so nobody can then look at her. I don't know how that would be enforced, but that is what the point would be. That nobody should be able to look at her. And also it is said in the books of Sirah that uh, uh, it was more common for women to do this in the middle of the night, meaning uh, that not in the daytime, that they would do this. And of course there was no lighting uh, back at that time. Uh, so the point being that this was the custom that existed. And uh, the Prophet Wasallam explicitly said, I do not want to be doing Hajj with that type of you know, uh, environment. Now, it is very interesting to note over here that the Prophet ﷺ made a firm stand. He's not going to go for Hajj because of this. And this is definitely the befitting and appropriate thing for Rasulullah ﷺ to do. But he sends Abu Bakr and 300 people. 
and and for the first 53 years of his life without a doubt this must have been taking place in Mecca now obviously the books of Sirah don't mention anything because they shouldn't I mean it's clear this is happening but so what does this show and the reason I mentioned this now of course I mean astaghfirullah if this is happening our process obviously is lowering his gaze there's no question about that but the point here that I want to stress that merely being in an environment of, fah, of fahsha is not in and of itself haram for you that you have to leave the country or go somewhere else. Because our Prophet did not leave Mecca, even though women are doing tawaf of this in this nature. And it is clear that it's public there. And I say this because we do have a lot of, especially our young men, they go through these phases of just like, you know, everything becomes haram, living in the West becomes haram, because why? Because there's fahsha everywhere. Well, firstly, go to the East and you'll see the same amount, if not the worst fahsha, right? You guys are living in some deluded land, if you think that that's not, especially with the internet and television and whatnot. There is no utopia anywhere anymore. The same fahsha over there, maybe you might not see the billboard, maybe. But do you think that there's anything less on the internet, on television, on DVDs and whatnot, it's the, just as bad, if not worse, because of where, where and who those people are. But secondly, this incident clearly shows us that our Prophet for 53 years, when he is the minority, he is the oppressed with the Quraysh there, what are you going to do? You lower your gaze, you fight your own battle. Just because it's happening outside doesn't mean your presence there is haram. And this is especially true when there is no place to go, such as I would say in our times. There is no place for us to uh, to go to. And as long as we protect ourselves to the greatest extent possible, فَاتَّقُوا ma astata'atum. Insha'Allah ta'ala, there is no sin on us to be in that public environment as long as we battle with our own uh, gaze. So our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Abu Bakr to do what? To lay the foundations for the final year of his life. That would be the final hajj, hajjatul wada. That that hajj, it should be a perfect hajj. So he sent Abu Bakr. Now there are no idols in Mecca. That, that was eighth year. Gone. But there are still going to be what? Pagans coming from all over Arabia. And they're going to have their weird and bizarre customs. So he sends Abu Bakr as siddiq to make sure that there are not going to be these rituals anymore. And that there are not going to be any pagans anymore. From now on, Mecca is going to be a, an Islamic site. There's not going to be any idol worshippers uh, coming over there. And uh, as soon as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left uh, the city of Medina, within a few hours, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah At-Tawbah, or I, would, I should say the first three pages of Surah At-Tawbah, two and a half pages of Surah At-Tawbah. And these verses are directed to uh, the pagans of Arabia. And what is the wisdom? Uh, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delay this? Allah knows best. But maybe it was because uh, of exactly what happened. And that is that when somebody said to the, Abu, to the Prophet Sallam, why don't you send these verses to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? So he said, no one shall convey these verses on my behalf other than somebody from my own household. And he chose Ali ibn Abi Talib who was not a part of the initial hujjaj. He was told to stay. There was a group of 300, I forgot to mention 300, were chosen along with 25 sacrificial animals. So 25 badanas, yani, uh, hadi, uh, 25 hadi the Prophet ﷺ sent and 300 Muslims. Uh, and at the head was Abu Bakr. Ali was not told to be in that group. So Ali is staying in Medina. Within a few hours, literally, because Abu Bakr has not yet reached Dhul Hulayfa. And that's literally going to take a few hours. Surah Tawbah comes down. So the Prophet ﷺ tells Ali ibn Abi Talib to go catch up to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, take these verses and then announce them to the people uh, uh, in, in the Hajj time. So we need to quickly go over what are these verses of uh, At-Tawbah, Surah At-Tawbah. And of course, Surah At-Tawbah was one of the very, very final surahs revealed. And some say it is the final large surah to be revealed. Others say the final is Surah Al-Ma'idah. So Ma'idah and Tawbah are the final surahs to be uh, revealed. And a tawbah, of course, we all know, even our young children know, that the one thing about Surah Tawbah is what? That sets it apart. No basmala. No bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And 
There are a number of opinions. Two of them are the most famous ones. Why it doesn't have the basmala? Uh, the first of them is narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. And he was asked, why doesn't Surah At-Tawbah have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? And he, when, now his response, it makes sense now for today's lecture now. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is what you write at the beginning of a contract of protection, of Rahma. Right? That we're going to now have a treaty or truce. And Surah At-Tawbah is about Bara'a, which is to cut off the ties, to disassociate. And so you're not going to start the surah of dissociation by saying in the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Because Allah is saying in the surah, in the very first or second verse, Inna Allah bari'um min al Allah has nothing to do. Bari, uh, in English we say, I've washed my hands off of. Yani bari means I have nothing to do. So it's not befitting that such a surah begins with Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. This is uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib's statement. And then there's a hadith in Tirmidhi, which is the second reason given, which is really confusing for the beginning students of knowledge. And uh, we don't have time to get into the, the details, but I'll just tell you. And then maybe at a later time, we can go into some of those details. Uh, Uthman ibn Affan was asked by his student, uh, why didn't you put the basmala uh, at the beginning of Surah At-Tawbah? And also, why did you combine Anfal and Tawbah, even though Anfal is early Makkah and Tawbah is late, sorry, early Medina, and Tawbah is late Medina? There is no connection in date of chronology that Anfal is Badr. Anfal is Badr. And Tawbah is post-Tabuk. Tawbah is Tabuk and post-Tabuk, right? Because remember, we went over all of Tabuk and Masjid Dara, remember? This is all happening now. And then the beginning portion of Tawbah is revealed uh, in the end of the ninth year. So Surah Tawbah is all ninth year. And Surah Al-Anfal is all first and second year. So one of his students says, why would you combine Anfal and Tawbah, even though their dates are so far apart? And then why didn't you put Bismillah? And so Uthman ibn Affan says, according to the hadith in Tirmidhi, that the content of the two was similar. They're both qital and jihad, which is very true. And Tawbah was revealed very late, and we didn't know whether it was a separate surah or not, so we just put it with Anfal. And because we didn't know if it's a separate surah, we didn't write Basmalah. So this is another reason given. Now this raises a whole can of worms, but it's not related to Sirah. That's Ulum al-Quran. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that, but it is in my book and other uh, references you can find. The point being, let us now uh, go over uh, the very first verses of Tawbah. Bara'atu min Allahi wa rasulihi ila alladhina ahadtu min al-mushrikeen. Bara'atu min Allahi wa rasulihi. This is a declaration of dissociation. It's a very powerful beginning. It's a very powerful beginning. Bara'atum min Allahi wa Rasuli. That this is a declaration of cutting off all ties. Dissociation. There is no powerful word in English like bara'a in Arabic. That literally cutting off all ties. From Allah and His Messenger. To all those who we have some treaties with from the pagans. So there were treaties in the 6th year, 7th year, 8th year, all of these treaties. Now this is the declaration that all of those treaties are going to be made null and void. Now anytime you have a treaty with somebody, before you break it off, you have to tell them. You cannot surprise break it off. It's against Islam, it's against etiquette. You have a contract, you're, even in our modern day, when your employer fires you or whatever, there is a clause there, isn't there? Right? That there has to be what is it for most of you? Three months, two months, what? I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's not open this door. <laughs> okay. Any second is like that. But most employers have a clause, right? That if the termination is from their side, they'll give you one month or something notice, right? Okay, is this old school? 90, okay. So some of, some of the guys are 90 days, some of you are zero. Okay. Okay, so the union guys have 90 days and the non-unions have zero. <laughs> Okay, the point being, the point being that generally speaking, when you annul the contract, it is good to have this clause. Uh, and this is the way that even our Sharia operates, that if you have a, a treaty with an enemy nation or something, you cannot just break the treaty uh, as you attack them. That's completely un-Islamic, is haram. Rather, if you want to break off the treaty, you have to tell them, look, we have one month left and khalas, it's gone. This is like the... Uh, end of treaty 
associated. This is what is happening now. This is what Allah is revealing this surah for. That any treaty we have, we are now going to break it off. And Allah then gives the conditions and the, uh, and the uh, details of that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسِيحُ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ So go ahead and wander around for four months. Do what you want for four months. So all treaties are going to come to an end in four months. You have four months and you are completely safe and free for four months. Not just in your lands, because the treaties were specific to the Banu this, the Banu that. Now Allah is saying, I am making the treaty broader in terms of geography. For four months, you are free to go anywhere. Anywhere and do whatever you want. Pack your stuff, you know, take care of business, uh, visit family, whatever you need to do. You have four months to do that. And Allah Azza wa Jal is not giving this to you because He is weak. This is not because Allah is incapacitated. No, this is a generous gift to you, and Allah Azza wa Jal will humiliate the uh, pagans. And this shall be a declaration. Adhan. This is a declaration from Allah and His Messenger to all of mankind on the day of the big Hajj, Al Hajj Al Akbar. And this is the day of sacrifice, Yom Al Nahr which is the day after Arafah. This is Al-Hajj Al-Akbar. This is the day after Arafah. That Allah and His Messenger have cut off all relationship from the Mushrikeen, from the pagans. There is no more relationship with the uh, pagans. So if you repent, it is good for you. And if you turn away, then know that you are not going to defeat Allah and that uh, give glad tidings to those who reject uh, that they shall have a severe uh, punishment. Except, there is an exception here. Except, meaning the four months, those whom you have a specific treaty with the pagans, with a time clause. Now the four months is those you don't have a time clause with. If you have a specific treaty with the pagans, any tribe, and they have not broken their promise at all, then in that case Allah says, فَأَتِمُّ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدَهُمْ إِلَى مُدَّتِهِمْ Go ahead and fulfill their contract or treaty until you put that time clause in goes away. And that is because there were some small tribes, the Prophet actually put a time clause for one year, for this many months, he put a time clause. So we are a fair nation and people. And if the time clause was at the beginning of the treaty, and they didn't break anything of the treaty, then you don't have the right to break the treaty. You understand the difference between an unconditional treaty and a conditional treaty. So Allah puts the exception here. The conditional treaty that had a time clause, and they were good to you, and they honored the treaty, then how about them? Then فَأَتِمُّ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدًا إِلَى مُدَّتِهِمْ Go ahead and fulfill their treaty until their time clause finishes. So be fair to those who are fair to you. Then the fifth verse comes and I have to go into a little bit of detail because this is the most misinterpreted verse from Islamophobes. This is the verse that is always used by Fox News and by Spencer and Pamela Geller and all of these people. This is that verse. It is called the verse of the sword. Ayatu as safe. The verse of the sword. And you have to understand this verse in the context of the ninth year of the Hijrah. In the conquest, con after the conquest of Mecca, paganism is being eliminated. All of this needs to be understood. That Allah says, when the sacred months finish. Now, what are the sacred months? Some scholars said the sacred months are the famous sacred months of the Hijri calendar. Others said, Allah called the four months in verse number two, He called them the sacred months because those are the four months you cannot fight for this particular year. Meaning for this year, those four months have become sacred because you cannot fight. So basically when those four months finish, you understand? Some ulama said Ashur al-Hurum means the classical Ashur al-Hurum. But Allahu Alam, the stronger opinion appears to be the Ashur al-Hurum in this verse are the four months Allah just talked about in the previous verse. So when the sacred months, those four months finish, then what? then you have an open license to attack and kill and uh, surprise them and whatever. Take them prisoner, do whatever needs to be done. Now, now, no, see here's the point here. Here's the point. This verse was revealed for the Haram and for the Arabian Peninsula. That there's not going to be paganism 
idol worship in that sacred land anymore. You cannot worship an idol in the lands of the Haram. And so they were given four months. You have two options. Get rid of your paganism and accept Islam. And that's exactly what Allah says uh, in this very verse. That the, is the verse of the sword that Allah says. But if they repent and they start praying and giving zakah, then they are your brethren. Allow them to be what they want to be. So in the same verse of the sword, after they've been told, you have four months, you can either pack your bags and get out or face war. And that is because it is not allowed in our Islamic Sharia for, idol for idolatry to be practiced in the Arabian Peninsula. You cannot have idolatry practiced openly in the Arabian Peninsula. And that's something that is pretty much agreed upon. Uh, now, scholars have differed outside of the Arabian Peninsula. And historically speaking, pretty much every single uh, Muslim ruler from the Umayyads and the Abbasids and the Ottomans and the Mughals of India, they all tolerated uh, paganism outside of the Arabian Peninsula. So fiqh is one thing, reality is another. That realistic or um, historically speaking, historically speaking, non, now of course by unanimous consensus Jews and Christians are allowed to live in an Islamic state. There's no, there's never a controversy over this that if they pay the jizya, they can live in, uh, under the Islamic rule. The ikhtilaf came over non-Jews, Christians and Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians were added by Umar ibn al-Khattab. Because Umar added Zoroastrians, Umar ibn al-Khattab was the first commander to conquer uh, non-pagans and non-Christians and Jews, i.e. the Zoroastrians. When he conquered Persia, there were Zoroastrians there. So the Sahaba differed, what do we do now? And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, ahl al-kitab." Treat them like you treat Ahl al-Kitab, except that you cannot marry their women and their meat is not halal, meaning they pay the jizya and they are protected. Clear? Now, Based on this, I'm going into a tangent by the way, this is not Sira, but I know all of you want to know this. This is something that we should know. Uh, based on this, all of the Madahib agreed that Yahud, Nasara, and Majus are allowed to live in Darul Islam if they pay jizya. Clear? There's no ikhtilaf in this at all. That they can practice their faith, have their churches and synagogues and fire temples. As long as they pay jizya, they are protected by the state. Of course, there are conditions. They cannot proselytize. Let's be very, um, we're not painting that society to be a post-liberal, post-modernist, post-humanistic, secular society. No, it's very clear. You're allowed to be Christian Jew or, or Zoroastrian, but you cannot convert other people. You and your children and your families, go ahead. But you cannot convert other people to your faith that are not a part of your faith. That's very clear in Islamic uh, textbooks. But the point being, the ikhtilaf came, what if you're not Christian Jew or Zoroastrian? This is where the madhahib differed. Some madhahib said, no tough luck. You only allowed these. And others said, no, it's okay. What Umar said of the Majus applies to every other religion. You understand this point, okay? And I said fiqh is one thing and history is another. No matter what the fuqaha said, historically the khulafa basically allowed every single uh, religious group to be who they are as long as they didn't proselytize and they didn't fight and be a nuisance. And the classic example of this, I mentioned this two months ago when the Yazidi crisis happened. The Yazidis are the classic example. That the Yazidis have existed under the Abbasids and under the Umayyads and under the Mamluks and they are neither Christian nor Jew nor Zoroastrian nor Muslim. They are a heretical or semi-heretical group. They have their own bizarre, their, their beliefs go back to the ancient beliefs of Iraq where they were. They have some rather bizarre things and they are mistakenly called Satan worshippers, even though that's not technically true, but uh, they have their bizarre beliefs. The point is they were tolerated. And other, I mean, the Mughals is another example, right? That the Mughals were the largest um, empire in India, and they had no problem with uh, the Hindus being there. And they, uh, Aurangzeb is considered to be a fanatic simply because he tried to institute uh, jizya. But he never ever said that the Hindus have to convert or get expelled. Right? Just because he wanted to institute the jizya, and he said, and he's basically resurrecting Umar's opinion. 
that uh, we're going to take jizya from them. The point being that this verse cannot be taken as a carte blanche uh, ex uh, execution order on all non-Muslims. And one simple historical fact that not a single person lost his or her life because of this verse. This verse is a threat. You have four months or else you're gone. It's a threat and it was meant to be a threat that scared the people and that is why paganism disappeared from Arabia, which was exactly what Islam wanted. So to take this verse, kill the pagans wherever you find them, that's what they always do. Or they say kill the infidels wherever you find them. And to ignore the entire context that in the same verse, or actually in the next verse, verse number six, Allah is saying, that if any mushrik seeks your protection, then grant him protection until you explain to him Islam and take him to a safe place, then after that he is on his own, you're on your own. So verse number six clearly says, Anybody wants protection, give him protection, explain to him Islam, accompany him to the borders, get rid of him, and then you go your way, he goes his way. Not one person was actually killed or executed as a result of this verse. It was meant to threaten the pagans. Either accept and stay where you are, or pack your bags, get rid of your businesses, sell your stuff, and go live elsewhere. And that's exactly what happened. Paganism is wiped out of Arabia and that was the goal of the Prophet and of Islam and we will not, not sugarcoat this at all. We do not want idolatry to be taking place in the Arabian Peninsula. Idolatry was not wiped out from the rest of the world, even from the rest of the Muslim lands. And we've given examples of this, but it was wiped out in uh, Arabia. Now, another point here. So, uh, another major controversy historically is the issue of Ali ibn Abi Talib being chosen uh, to convey this message, convey this message uh, to the pagans, uh, uh, to the pagans of the Hajj of the ninth year. So ninth year of the Hajj, of the Hijrah, is the only year ever in the history of humanity where Muslims and pagans performed Tawaf and Hajj simultaneously. Never before were as official delegation of Muslims and the official delegations of the pagans that have come from other lands performing Hajj simultaneously. This was the one and only time in the ninth year of the Hijrah that you had pagans that had not accepted Islam, the periphery regions, other regions, right? North, south, east, west, not everybody is a Muslim. So Ali ibn Abi Talib is sent to announce to all of those pagans, go back to your people and tell them, Either ship up or shape out. You got four months. Four months. If you don't, we will attack you. And that was the clear point. Now, the question of course is, uh, why was Ali chosen? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was given Surah At-Tawbah, or I should say the first two pages of Surah Tawbah, and uh, he quickly gallops up to Dhul Hulayfa, which is, as you know, the Miqat of Medina. Abu Bakr is just at Dhul Hulayfa. He sees Ali and Ali was given the personal camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was a sign that the rulers would always do. They would give a personal ring or a personal staff or a personal camel to be representative of the ruler. And when Abu Bakr saw Ali riding on the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, immediately he asked him, are you being sent to be a commander over me? Or am I still going to be the commander and you are lieutenant or second in command basically? And Ali says, no you are still the commander. The Prophet didn't send me to take over from you. You're still the commander, but I've been come to send or to, to recite Surat uh, At-Tawbah. Now, of course, uh, you understand this is going to cause a huge tension between which groups and which groups. Huh? Obviously. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, obviously, the uh, Shia interpret this and they say this is explicit that Ali should have been the Khalifa. I mean, the, out of all of the evidences, so this is on the top two or three that they say, right? Of course, the top one, of course, is the Ghadir Khum incident, which uh, we'll come to, or we'll talk about maybe later on. That's the number one always, Ghadir Khum, always. And then of the top two or three, they say this incident here, that in Hajj of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, when the Prophet 
had to be represented, he clearly said, no one shall represent me other than my family member. And he chose Ali and he sent him to uh, announce to the uh, pagans the Surat at tawbah Now, this is actually, as is typically the case, very easy for us to understand in the proper way. We have our interpretation, they have their interpretation. Uh, Al-Baghawi and other historians and Mufassirun mention that it was the custom of pre-Islam that we can all understand that when the chieftain or the ruler or the leader wants to make a treaty or break a treaty, you have to send somebody from his family to enact that treaty on his behalf. And because he's dealing with the Jahili Arabs, he wants to make sure there's no excuse that somebody can say, oh, we're not going, because these are not Muslims now. He's dealing with pagans. And they're still steeped in the culture of Jahiliyyah, where lineage is everything and family is everything. And so he wanted to provide no excuse for them. And he sends Ali ibn Abi Talib to break the treaty that he himself had enacted. You know, the general treaties that don't have the clause, right? So who's going to break it? Somebody from his own family will say you have four months left. So that there's no excuse left that, oh, we're not going to accept Abu Bakr. We have to take this directly from the Prophet ﷺ himself. And the simplest uh, correct understanding for us is that Abu Bakr and Ali are both in the same convoy of Hajj. Ali literally says to Abu Bakr, you know, you are still the Amir and I am the Ma'mur. I am the one under you. So the interpretation of the Shia for our perspective is simply incorrect to say that Ali, this indicates that Ali is more uh, rightful of the Khilafah. In this incident, you have two of the greatest of the Sahaba, Abu Bakr and Ali together. And the Prophet sends the both of them. But Ali is not sent as the Amir. Ali is sent for a task. And that task is to break the treaty. And Abu Bakr is the overall Amir. And for us, this clearly demonstrates because again, Alhamdulillah, we love Ali the way he should be loved. And we are more rightful to be Ali's partisans. I have said this in my Karbala lecture. We are the true Shia to Ali. Meaning we are the ones who support him and believe in him the way that it is worthy to be believed in. And so we have no problems giving every blessing that is given to Ali radiallahu an. And this is a great blessing and a great honor. And we have no stinginess in saying he is indeed the Al al-Bayt and he represents the Prophet and whatnot. But this doesn't mean that he should have been the Khalifa over the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So uh, this was the only Hajj we said in Islamic history that was performed by both Muslims and some remnants of the, the pagans. And it was also the only Hajj that uh, the rites of Hajj were still performed according to the old ways. In other words, the Prophet did not show the, the, the correct way of Hajj. So the Hajj of the Mushrikun was slightly different in terms of order and whatnot. So Abu Bakr is doing it in the old way because that's what is accustomed uh, to. By the way, how many Hajj did the Prophet do? How about before the Hijrah? How about before the Hijrah when he's living in Makkah? There were no orders, I mean, there was no command of uh, Hajj during that time. Was Hajj an institution? No. Not Hajj as we know it. They had their own Hajj. They had their own Hajj. Correct? And much of that Hajj was taken from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Going to Arafah, you know, going, doing Tawaf, doing Sa'i, they had that. Right? So did the Prophet do those or not? So the books of Sirah don't mention, but it is understood he must have done Hajj when he was in Mecca after the Prophet. Not only when he was young before Prophet, so obviously he would have done in those days, but after the 40th, his 40th year, would he have done Hajj? The books of Sirah don't, don't mention, but it's understood like the average Makkawi person living in Mecca to this day. I mean, wallahi, if you live in Mecca and you don't do Hajj, honestly, you have a problem. And if you live in Mecca and you don't go for the Hajj, I mean, many of my friends who live in Mecca, uh, they literally just on the day of Arafah take their car and drive to Arafah because it's 20 minutes away, okay? And then they drive back home and whatnot. That's all you got to do. I mean, you drive to Arafah, you do Tawaf, you whatnot. So for the Makkawi not to do Hajj, and Arafah is 10 minutes away, just take the bus or whatever and then come back to your home and whatnot. So how could the Prophet not have done Hajj? But, uh, you know? Being a, uh, being 
Yes, after being a prophet, why would he not do Hajj? But there's nothing wrong with the Hajj of those times of Arafat, Tawaf, Sa'i. There's nothing wrong with that. So. So that is a time when he is being persecuted, whereas now he is in charge and he can enforce law, whereas back then he cannot enforce law, right? So that was my point. What, did he leave Mecca for 13 years? No. So clearly it is happening, right? Let, let's finish this inshallah, and then because we're starting the Q&A right now. So, uh, so Abu, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq performs the Hajj Ali radiallahu anhu and along with him Abu Huraira is also sent. The two of them announced throughout Mina. They announce uh, four major announcements. They recite Surah at tawbah the first two pages, so that everybody knows you got four months. Then they have four major announcements to make. Number one, no one shall enter Jannah other than a Muslim or a Mu'min. Or in another version, the Kafir shall not enter Jannah. Number two, no one shall perform Tawaf naked. Number three, no mushrik shall ever perform tawaf again. This is the final year. And number four, any contract that exists with the pagans, with any tribe, shall have four months. After this, there is no treaty or contract with any tribe unless there's a special clause for a time clause. We talked about that, right? So these are the four major uh, announcements in Hajj of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Now, the first point is very interesting. Why mention that no one shall enter Jannah except a Muslim? No kafir shall enter Jannah. So this is now perhaps the final da'wah that is being given to groups of people that might decide to leave Arabia forever. Because they've heard the success of Islam, they know they have either two options, convert or leave. It's never convert or die, by the way. Convert or leave Arabia. So, they're being told the most important thing that they need to realize. There is no way to Jannah other than Islam. And honestly, for me, this is a very important point for our modern times. Because this principle of Islam is being watered down. And many of our youth find it difficult to swallow. And I have a more extensive lecture online uh, salvific exclusivity in Islam I have an academic, it was an academic paper You can find it online uh, But <clears throat> to me the fact that the Prophet Mentions this as the first announcement In the final hajj that the Pagans would ever attend It really demonstrates, I mean Quranic wise And even logic wise It's common sense If you believe in a religion, it had better be a religion That saves you from Allah's anger and punishment If other religions also save you Then why believe in this one religion? The purpose of religion is to be guided to Jannah. The purpose of religion is the pleasure of Allah. If you're going to say, oh, many other religions do that and guide you to the pleasure of Allah, then why reveal another religion? Why even follow one religion? Just choose the other one that you think is also valid. Religion by its nature, logically, should be exclusive. In terms of Allah's pleasure. In terms of this world, the fiqh is clear. You do what you want. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ That's fiqh. That's this world. You have your way, I have my way. No problem in this world. But in the Akhirah, it doesn't make sense. You either believe in idolatry or you don't. You believe in monotheism or you believe in polytheism or you believe in Trinitarianism or you believe in this and that. Not all of them can be simultaneously valid. And so the Prophet is telling the, the, the Mushrikun, the final opportunity, you only have one way to get to Jannah and that's through La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. As for the issue of doing tawaf naked, it was enforced even in the Hajj of Abu Bakr. So even in the ninth year, nobody did tawaf naked. Because that was enforced right then and there. As for the pagans not doing tawaf, that was not enforced that year. Because they're already there. That was enforced for next year. So in the ninth year, nobody did tawaf naked. That was the eighth year, was the final year. In the ninth year, pagans did do hajj. But they were told, final year. And then they are told, you have four months left. Otherwise, you have to uh, leave. And therefore, uh, this was a clear signal that Islam had triumphed over idolatry. This is the final 
if you like, nail in the coffin of idolatry. And as I said many, many, many times, this is one of the most amazing U-turns in, in human history. That in 20 years, in 20 years, an entire civilization gives up its heritage of over 3,000 years and accepts a new religion. There are no, um, there, there are, I can make a joke about Arab idols, uh, you know, I'm not gonna, bad joke, sorry. The Pakistanis don't get it. <laughs> There's a show called, yeah, okay, so forget that. Uh, there are, I was gonna say there are no Arab idols, but then our Palestinian brothers would get very, uh, very hurt because you have an Arab idol, la hawla khusla But anyway, um, there are no pagans anymore that are Arabs. It's gone completely. There are still Arab Christians. Islam tolerated them, right? There used to be Arab Jews up until 1948. You know this. In fact, still there are, ethnically speaking, there are Arab Jews, ethnically, but they're losing their language because when they migrated to Israel, so they lost their language now. But there were Jews in Morocco, Jews in Yemen, Jews. They were Arab Jews. Islam tolerated. But nowhere were there Arab pagans anymore. Why was this? Because of these verses. And this is one of the most interesting, if you like, miracles of Islam, that Islam, I eliminated idolatry amongst an entire civilization. And uh, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw the culmination of his efforts there. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. So that was in the ninth year of the Hijrah. Also in the ninth year of the Hijrah, uh, I already mentioned this before, but it was towards the end of the ninth year. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent many Sahaba as either governors or teachers of Islam to various places around the kingdom, especially in the north and in the south, and especially down south. We know of many famous Sahaba who went. Uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was sent, and I told you the story before. He walked with Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He told him, I might not see you again. Uh, others were sent as well down uh, south, and especially down south, Islam it seemed flourished. People accepted Islam very quickly, very easily. They accepted Islam. And one final uh, incident of accepting Islam uh, also took place in this year, and that is in the province of Najran. So Najran is a little bit above Yemen and uh, south of Arabia. So it's south of Hijaz and above Yemen. So province, that is in our times, the southernmost province of the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So Najran borders Yemen, clear, right? So this is the southernmost province of modern Saudi Arabia. By the way, it's a very beautiful province. It's a very luscious, very green. Its people are very different ethnically even. Their language is slightly a different type of Arabic uh, accent and whatnot. Uh, So this province of Najran, our Prophet ﷺ sent Khalid ibn al-Walid uh, in the beginning of the 10th year of the Hijrah. Just quickly, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, uh, much to say here, but uh, I don't want to delay this till, till afterwards. And he told Khalid ibn al-Walid, do not attack them until you give them three days. Until you give them three days and tell them that they have the option of accepting Islam. uh, Or if they're Christian or Jew, they pay jizya or they have to leave. Okay, because pagans are not allowed to stay. So three days they have. And this shows us again the mercy of the Sharia that this is a very big momentous decision. They have to make it. And if they don't accept, then you can fight them after three days. So Khalid ibn al-Walid sent... Uh, criers into the, 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 the main cities and whatnot, and he said, these are your options here, the famous options that we all know about, and lo and behold, they all accepted Islam. The entire province of Najran accepted Islam, and so Khalid ibn Walid was really confused, what do I do now? I brought an army, there's no fighting. So he sends a letter back to the process, and I'm saying, Ya Rasulullah, the people of Najran, they all embraced Islam, and I'm now here, what do I do? And so the Prophet sent a letter back, send a delegation up to me. Send a few people up, meaning I want to test them. Are they really Muslim? Or I want to teach them, whatnot. So a delegation comes from uh, the group of, from the people of Najran. And Ibn Ishaq mentions a very interesting conversation that I tried myself to decipher today uh, and I was not able to do so. What is the point of interest for me? So uh, the group enters in and the Prophet did not recognize them. Uh, and he said, Man al qawm which is the polite way of saying, who are you? But it's a polite way of saying this in Arabic. I mean, uh, like, you know, uh, 
who do I have the pleasure of welcoming? How would we say this in it? So, man uh, al then he says that, ka'annakum uh, rijalun min al hind, which is was something I did not understand. And I looked up all of the reference I have, which translates as, you seem to be Indians. Right? Now, why would the Prophet call the people of Najran hind, people from India? Like as if you look, now he's not saying you are Indians, but as if you are from India. Now this is interesting because we don't know of any Indian, Hind, that the Prophet ever met in his life. For as far as we know, no Hindi ever came down to, to Mecca, contrary to what maybe Pakistanism might want to believe. No, no Hindi came and, you know, and then, and, and, sorry guys, it didn't happen, right? Uh, <laughs> as far as we know, as far as we know, we don't know of anybody. Uh, so what, why would this be? I tried to look up, I couldn't find anything. But I have my theories and Allah knows best. Of those theories is that uh, the people of Najran, their complexion is different than other Arabs. And so maybe their complexion and their fe features, <laughs> perhaps this was what led him to say that they, uh, as if you are from Hind. Uh, also, it is known that the people of Najran had a different type of hairstyle that they would like. Now, remember, at that time, Hind was, of course, completely pagan and, and whatnot. So their hairstyles were round and the um, curly and whatnot. Allahu Allah may be this as well, but I don't know. Why are these being called Hind? So when they said they are from the Najran, so the Prophet has some back and forth. A little bit of it is harsh, but he's testing their Iman. He's saying, are they really Muslim or not? And I don't have time to go into the whole conversation. But he wants to see whether they really are genuinely Muslim or not. And in the end, they come out with flying colors that they are uh, Muslim. And so the Prophet asked them a question that, tell me, what was the secret or the reason that you're always winning against anybody who attacks you? Why are you always the victors? So they say two things. They say, number one, we always are united. Once we make a decision, we never fight amongst ourselves. We go as a team, right? And number two, we never did zulm to other people. We never did zulm to other people. Unless they did zulm, then we attack back. Otherwise, we are never zalim. And subhanAllah, this shows us, wallahi, this is like a class on management or whatever, nothing to do. You want to be successful, teamwork, work us together, and don't take the rights of other people. Don't do something that is, you know, underhanded or whatever. Be uh, dignified and whatnot. Uh, and so the Prophet then sent uh, Amr ibn Hazm uh, al Ansadi to be their religious leader and governor. And he sent a letter uh, that one month before he passed away uh, to Amr ibn Hazm instructing him how to be a religious leader. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about that letter next time. I'll see. Because this letter, by the way, is one of the most famous letters in the seerah. Why? Because it was the last letter that our Prophet dictated in his life. And it's over a page long. And it is meant, it is directed to Amr ibn Hazm. And it's basically a whole bunch of wasiyas. A whole bunch of commandments of, of how to, you know, teach them and whatnot. So basically, it is one of the last things. One month before he passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the people of Najran, they accepted Islam four months before he passed away. Literally one month before the Hajj. So this is now the very last major province under Hijaz. It converts to Islam. And then uh, he sends this letter to Amr ibn Hazm. And it is a very famous letter. Uh, and by the way, one phrase in it uh, is the phrase that most of the fuqaha uh, discuss so much about. Because it says in it, no one should touch the Quran except if he's tahir. La yamasu Qurana illa tahir. So from this, the majority of the madahib all say to touch the Quran, you need to have wudu. What is their number one evidence? It is the hadith of Amr ibn Hazm that the Prophet sent him a letter when he was the governor. This is that. That's a fiqh issue. And for those who took that, the class of fiqh, remember, we talked about this, this phrase here. Final interesting tidbit, tangent, whatnot. Uh, these days, Najran has an interesting twist in it. What is Najran known for? Who can tell me? Hmm? What is Najran known for? Louder. Now, 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 now. Well, okay, that's true, but theologically. No, there are no Christians in Najran. There are no Christians in Najran anymore. 
Houth, no, not even Houthi or Yemeni. Close. Keep on going. Keep on going. They're Indians. Indians are everywhere, man. That's the problem. Look around you. We're surrounded by Indians, man. <laughs> but you're not Hindi. Don't worry. Um, Najran is the only place in. No, 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 no. Not Zaidi. Ismaili Arabs. Exactly. That's the sentiment I was waiting for. What? Ismaili Arabs. It's the only place that has, especially in Arabia, so Saudi Arabia, in the modern Saudi Arabia, has places that have 12 or Shia, right? Yemen has five or Shia, Zaydis, okay? Najran is the one province in that entire region that is predominantly Ismaili Shia. Not Twelver, not Fiver, not, no, Ismailis. Now, most of you know Ismailis. Most of you know who are the Ismaili Shia, right? So in the Fatimid reign, reign very quickly, I, I mean, this is my, I love these things. This is my area of speciality, all of these theologians and whatnot. This is not a part of the, the seerah, by the way. In the Fatimid time, I know you all want to know. So in the Fatimid time, uh, the Al-Azhar University was founded by the Fatimids, as you know. And they were the ones who would send out, they were the ones who coined the term da'wah, that we now use, da'wah, 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 and da'i. They were the ones who coined it and made it uh, popular that a caller to Islam is called Da'i, right? So they were the first group uh, to really make it to that type of technical term, to give da'wah to people. And we're gonna, you know, send da'is out. Of course it's halal to use, but I'm saying they were the first group to do that. And they had an Azhar University. So they sent out da'is across the globe to give da'wah, but not to Sunni Islam, but to Ismaili Islam. And so groups of people converted and groups converted in India and in Yemen and across the places. Uh, and the group that converted uh, in, in, in Yemen remained loyal to the Fatimid Empire. And then slowly but surely the Fatimid Empire disintegrated. There was a civil war uh, between two strands, the Musta'li and the Nizari. The Nizari, uh, the Nizari strand became what is called Aga Khanis. So the Aga Khani Imam claims biological descent from the Fatimid Empire from the Fatimid Khulafa. Whether that claim is true or not, I don't know. But he claims descent, biological descent from Nizar. Person's name is Nizar. Nizar's brother was Musta'li. And Musta'li's chain eventually disappeared. And that became what we call Buhra Ismaili Shi'ism. Okay? So, Bohras and Aga Khanis are blood brothers back somewhere, back in the Fatimid time. Musta'li and Nizar. Nizar became Aga Khanis. Musta'li, slowly but surely, his line disappeared. There was a baby by the name of Tayyib, and so Tayyib just disappeared. And so they say the Imam is in hiding. As all of the other Shia groups, they say the Imam is in hiding. The Aga Khanis are the only Shi'i group that says their Imam is Zahir. Their Imam is clear. They know their Imam. The 49th Imam, I think, is now uh, 49th, right? 49th or 48th? 49th, I think. Pretty sure. 49th Imam. Uh, the 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 12 verse say the Imam is in hiding. The seven or say anybody can be Imam. It's not something that is divinely appointed. The fivers, excuse me, the Zaydis. The Ismailis, they have split into many groups. The uh, Buhri, Musta'li, Tayyibi Ismailis. Okay, they're called Tayyibi. And Musta'li, because of this, they're called Buhri from the Gujarati Hindu term Vuhra, which means businessman. And so because they were businessmen in Gujarat, they were called Vuhra, Vuhra, Buhri. So they're Buhri, Musta'li, Tayyibi. They split into two branches, okay? You have, you have Dawoodi Buhra and you have Suleimani Buhra. Some of you guys, are, you know, I'm sorry for losing the Arabs and the non uh, Desis here, but the Desis, you all have heard Dawoodi Bohra. Yeah. Haven't you heard Dawoodi Bohra, right? Okay, why do they say Dawoodi Bohra? Because there's a split. The split is with Sulaimani Bohra. And the split is over who's in charge of running the Ismailis. Not who's the Imam, because the Imam is in hiding. The Dawoodi Bohra and the, and the Sulaimani Bohra, they had a split between two people named, guess what? 
Very good, you guys are smart, mashallah. <laughs> Dawood and Sulaiman. Okay. And so the Dawoodi Bohras went with Dawood, the Sulaimani Bohras went with Sulaiman, and the Dawoodi Bohras eventually primarily ended up in where? Where? Dawoodi Bohras, where? India. India. Where in India? Gujarat. Gujarat. So predominantly the Dawoodi Bohras are in Gujarat. That's where they're called Bohra. Their split occurred in the 1500s. Sulaiman was denied the leadership. So the Yemeni community accepted him as their leader. And they called him from India to come to Yemen. So he started the Sulaimani Dawood, sorry, Sulaimani Bohra Musta'ali Tayyibi Ismaili branch. Clear? Very simple, right? And from that time on, there they call him Da'i Al Mutlaq, the big Da'i. That's the title given by both Sulaimani and Bohri Dawoodi Shia. Okay? Their big guy is called a Da'i Al Mutlaq. To him you give 10%, to him you do this, that's the big guy. He's not the Imam. He is the representative of the Imam. Okay? And of course, these people are very, I mean, they're considered to be holy and pious. They're also very wealthy. Uh, but they say the wealth is used for their followers. And yani, I have a good friend of mine as well who's uh, of this. And, and from his perspective, his imam is very righteous and whatnot. Imam, his da'i is very righteous and whatnot. But in the end of the day, every person gives a good percentage of his money and they live uh, their lifestyles and whatnot. The point being, the Sulaimani, what I wanted to say, the da'i and mutlaq of the Sulaimani branch lives in Najran to this day. And the Saudi political establishment has a very tense relationship with this, because they're all Saudis now, because when King Abdul Aziz conquered Saudi Arabia, so Najran comes under Saudi rule, there is huge tension. And the human rights, uh, what is it, whatever they call human rights watch, whatever, they have lots of reports because these people from their perspective, and I'm sure I'm not even denying this, I'm sure it is the case, are persecuted, deprived of jobs, education, uh, because obviously, I mean, they are viewed to be of a heretical branch of Islam from the perspective of the establishment. And so the Da'i al-Mutlaq is a Saudi living in Najran and at least maybe half a million people uh, are following that version of Islam. They're all Najrani. The majority of that region, especially two or three of the prominent tribes are Ismaili. And it's something that uh, is very interesting if you go and look at it. But in any case, I like this type of stuff. Me, some of you don't like it. In any case, that's Najran for you. And they converted back in the day. And inshallah ta'ala, with that, we come to uh, the conclusion. Of Did they have the ihram before Islam? I do not know of any evidence that seems to suggest they would have ihram. Rather, our Prophet explicitly commanded the Muslims to wear ihram. And therefore, I would... I would estimate, but I am not 100% sure that the ihram is something that our Prophet came with. Allah knows best. Because he clearly said, don't wear this, don't wear that, don't wear this, and wear this. So the fact that he has to make this command seems to indicate it was not known to those before. Yes? A Saif al muhannad As for the Indian sword, this is mentioned in half a dozen poems of the prophetic era. Maybe it's possible. Good point. Maybe the armor that they wore seemed to be that. Yes, maybe it is possible. Good point there. Yeah, good addition there. Inshallah.